Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, apologies again for, for that slight delay. Um, my name is Nick Penston. I'm here with my colleague Juan Flores, and both of us work for Enterprise Cloud Computing. Uh, it's a centralized cloud organization within Fidelity Investments, and its mission is to power the next generation digital services for our 27 million customers. And over the next 45 minutes or so, we hope you can take away three key learnings and three key areas. The first is when you think about building delivery pipelines for multi-cloud, where do you start and what type of strategies uh, should you be thinking about? When you think about security and building seamless integration into those pipelines and that experience for your developers, what type of challenges are you going to meet and how can you overcome them? And finally, when you actually get the, when the rubber hits the road, when you put your hands on that keyboard and you think about architecture and design, what does that look like when you're building for this type of scale? Okay, so let's dive uh, right in. First, uh, a quick disclaimer. Um, so for this is a bit of context before we, we kind of get into the, the main piece of the deck. Uh, Fidelity Investments is a large financial services organization. We have about 10,000 plus technologists within our organization, so about a quarter of our workforce. And as I mentioned in the intro, about 27 million customers. And like a lot of organizations our size, you may have multiple lines of business who are, when you're taking on that cloud challenge, are doing it in their own way. They're uh, taking on those challenges themselves and you know, duplicating the effort involved in relation to taking on those challenges. And that results then in multiple speeds when you think about delivering that value and experiences out to your customers, but also when you think about compliance, audit, and security, there's inconsistencies across the organization and how they're handled, and particularly when you think about going to the cloud. And in a large organization, you're also going to have a challenge of different maturities from teams. So on one side of the spectrum, you're going to have teams that maybe not even understand what a 12-factor application is, they may not even be executing in an agile environment, and may not have very mature uh, automation practices as well. On the other end of the scale, you're going to have teams that are already doing cloud. They're already building 12-factor applications. They already have strong DevOps, DevSecOps practices. They're already operating in an agile environment and doing that in a, an extremely mature way. And somewhere in the middle, you're going to have groups that are beginning this journey. They're starting to learn about the cloud. They're starting to learn how to construct 12-factor applications and build resilient architectures for the cloud, their agile and automation is maturing at the same time. But when you think about meeting this challenge and really trying to enable your adoption for the cloud, where do you start? And one thing to consider is actually building a highway to the cloud. So what is this magical highway? This highway is ultimately a seamless end-to-end -end experience in which your applications are going to travel along, moving through all those checks and balances before it ends up in production. It enables frictionless security in the pipeline, enables your developers to develop secure applications for your customers. But what's in it for the business? What do they get out of building this type of highway? And one way to articulate this is to think about it in terms of outcomes. So you can Divide outcomes into two maybe key areas. One is around what's in it for the business. The other is what's in it for the developer. How does it empower them to go faster? When you think about the business side, it's going to help you deliver that value faster. It's going to help you do it in a more reliable, safe, and repeatable way. For your developers, it's going to allow them to focus above the value line. It, and above the value line is focusing on those features that your application cares about, your customers care about, the experiences that you're looking to provide them with, not what's below the value line, which ultimately is the automation which brings that application to the cloud. So how do you get these uh, outcomes and ultimately where do you start? Now when we, I was constructing this slide, I actually could have spent 45 minutes on this piece alone, and I'm not going to do that. So, but a couple of things to think about when you think about transformation. First, when you think about moving DevOps, DevSecOps, what are the type of things you want to enable and how can pipelines really help you? So when you think of everything as code, pipelines code is a cornerstone in relation to that. So it's definitely something you want to consider. When you think about security, how do you provide that friction of security I mentioned earlier? How do you really embed that in to the pipeline and removing the complexities away from your engineers to understand all the intricate details about securing for the cloud? 
And finally, if you're a large organization, particularly if you're highly regulated, you're going to want to understand things like compliance and governance in relation to your workloads. How do you do that in an automated way? And that's a definitely a key focus for uh, large financial services firms. So when we think about uh, this highway, we're ready to go, right? So let's go, but whoa, right? So we have to think about this a little bit differently. When you have a large maturity uh, curve in relation to your teams, you can, it's unlikely that one strategy, when you apply it to those three facets of maturity, is actually going to work. So what can you do? So one way is to think about how do you target each one of these key areas uh, in different ways. And one way to approach it is possibly to be opinionated. So what does that mean? Opinionated means you're going to target a specific group, and in this case, the less mature uh, parts of your organization, and provide them with a mechanism to get to the cloud, and allow them to focus on learning things like developing your 12-factor applications, about building the skills in building those resilient architectures, rather than spending additional time to try to learn about automation to the cloud and the complexities that has to do with. So what does that look like? So this is, and I know it would be difficult from the back to see, this is an example, uh, a rudimentary example of what a pipeline might look like, uh, and in, it, in, it, in essence, to opinionate it. So the dark blue is around what does the application team do? And you can see it's ultimately focused on validating the quality of the application and focused on building the application where the rest of the highway is provided by the organization, which allows them to really pave out the most complex parts of that pipeline. So what's, what type of things could you be looking at? So for example, the security mechanisms I spoke about earlier. You're going to want to focus on them and extract them away from your engineers. When you look at, say, artifact management often overlooked, and I'm sure many people in this room have had the challenge of hygiene around artifact management and version management, maybe you want to embed that into this process so you can now instill best practice from the get-go. When you think of compliance, and again, if you're in a highly regulated environment or you're uh, depending on your risk posture, you want to be able to check, are these workloads compliant going to the cloud? And finally, consider around your deployment strategies, blue, green, red, black, canary, etc. How do you want to extract the complexities away from the engineer on how those things are knitted together, extracting the complexities away from those teams so they can really focus on the application? Now, there's some interesting outcomes when you take this approach. The first is it's going to help accelerate that uh, adoption and transformation on that end of the scale because they're focused purely on the transformation of those applications. It also removes the complexity away from going to the cloud. Because they're only focused on that key part, the rest is provided and paved for them uh, through that automation. Another key part is around your reuse. You're going to have a huge amount of teams, depending on the scale of the maturity, using these components, so alleviating some of the problems that I mentioned at the beginning. And another key part, again, often overlooked in, in every transformation, um, is around measurement. And because you're being so opinionated, because you can ultimately control that end-to-end -end experience, you can really knit in things like continuous auditing, continuous logging and telemetry to drive OBS availability, but also metrics coming out of that pipeline. So things like your adoption, the frequency deployment, really focus on understanding that transformation, things like mean time to recovery, lead time. These can all be done very accurately because you control the data stream. However, it's not all good news, right? There's also a lot of challenges when you take on this opinionated view. So we're all moving to the cloud. We're all going forward. But where are we going? Are we going to FAS, PAS, CAS? There's a huge amount of opportunity out there for teams. If you take this type of strategy and you try to handle in a whole breadth of these technology stacks, one, it's going to be difficult for you to scale. Two, it's going to be difficult to, tr to service and support. But three, there's a huge amount of workloads and variants of those workloads. It's not going to help you accelerate. So you might have to consider a narrower stack. And that means you might have to just focus on those applications going to a specific target, so a CAS or a PaaS platform, for example. Now, the downside of this is you're going to remove flexibility from your engineers. You're, going to, you're being very opinionated, and you're saying this is the track your application goes on, and you're even being opinionated about the target in which they're deploying to. Again, that's something uh, that you need to consider. 
Another key point is around version management. We're talking pipeline as code. It's sitting in all these repositories. So how do you ensure that teams are using the latest and greatest of your, of your, of your components when they're sitting out there? And Juan's going to talk a little about how we overcome that challenge in particular. So a couple of other considerations, tool integration. This is one key area that helped us in acceleration, is that you need a seamless experience of APIs and CLIs that you can knit together to create that workflow. In addition to capabilities, you can have multiple teams make driving those opinionated capabilities, which I mentioned. You need to have strong contracts between these uh, capabilities that you're going to write. For example, if you're going to say you're going to support semantic versioning throughout this pipeline, every single component needs to be handling dynamic uh, versioning, for example. If it does not, it's going to be like Duplo to Lego. It just ain't going to fit. Also, another key part, and I'm sure anyone here in the room going through any transformation, is talking about buy-in and the effect on that cultural change. This is a very opinionated approach. You're ultimately dictating how you're going to approach your cloud adoption. You need buy-in from your partners across your organization that this is the right approach, and also from a communication perspective for your developers. And finally, the developer experience, another key area which is often overlooked. So I'm sure everyone in this room has experienced some time when you've raised a ticket and you've had to wait to get something done. If you slow down the experience of onboarding onto these pipelines where people have to wait to get onto these pipelines and get onto the systems in which they're used, you're going to slow down your adoption, you're going to create frustration. So things like self-service, exposing uh, APIs or any sort of self-service mechanisms to allow your teams to onboard onto these is going to be paramount. And again, also from ease of use from the developer, this opinionated pipeline should be driven through configuration and made very easy uh, to work with with little documentation. But what about the guys on the other end of the spectrum? They're already in the cloud, they're already mature, they're already pushing applications out to the cloud. Will this opinionated approach work for them? Probably not. Because they already have the pipeline which I showed earlier and many, many blocks of that pipeline already. So what can we do in relation to teams that are in the cloud to align them already to, to our cloud strategy, but empower them also to go faster? And one way to do this is to only focus on the key capabilities which is important to you as an organization and enable these and only mandate these capabilities. So this is an example of uh, a pipeline in this space. So this is a team that already have mature capabilities, again in the dark blue. So they already have the, a lot of the key capabilities for the cloud. Again, this is a very simplified version. It's going to vary depending on your risk profile and, and the size of orga your organization. But in this example, we're really focused on understanding compliance of the application. That's all we care about. Everything else, go and do it. So again, your organization is going to enable these gates in the pipeline and only mandate this from a strategy perspective. So this is simplified from the previous. It's helping align the overall organization to, in this case, around policy and compliance. However, there's a couple of key challenges uh, in this approach. The first is these teams are already in the cloud. Again, they're working in FastPaths and any other permutation across multiple clouds. So this gate or gates that you're going to build for this type of strategy has to be able to service multiple workloads and the variance within those workloads. And that's a lot of work and a lot of automation. So how do you approach that challenge? Think about maybe focusing on particular platforms, enabling those applications through this pattern for those platforms, and then moving on to the next. The end-to-end -end integration is interesting. In the opinionated pipeline, we control the end-to-end. -end. We control the data flow, the real-time data you might be pumping out from your pipeline. You can gate on that data. You, uh, gate on your security, you know when a security tool is executed because you can drive some logging or eventing based off that. However, in this instance, you don't have that type of control. So how do you know, in the case of this example, that they've gone through those gates? You need to think end to end, and again, the strategy of understanding, in this case, the policy that they've gone through, is going to be different. The other interesting part is what we call closing the gate. So these teams already have permissions in the cloud. They're already deploying applications. And they may have permissions that ultimately you want to remove because they were too open and they were really created to enable people to go fast in the cloud. 
how do you create this strategy without being disruptive? That's a key part to that and avoiding any resistance to that change. One thing uh, we had a big discussion about this this morning was around this is a hugely overlooked part when you think about pipelines and just end-to-end -end experience from a developer. It's imperative that you empower these capabilities. They can be executed locally. That's on the developer's machine in the IDE. So you're not relying and being over-reliant on a CI part of your phase or your commit phase of your pipeline to get feedback. Pushing it down to the developer workstation or in, into their IDE is going to empower the developer to get feedback faster. And this is paramount when you come to things like security, for example. You do not want to be waiting to halfway through your pipeline to get feedback that you have vulnerabilities in your code. So hopefully that gives you uh, a quick idea of some of the approaches when you come to uh, transforming organization. And I'm going to move on and talk about security from a pipeline perspective and some of the things that you need to think about. Now this is a very, very wide space, but you can think about it in two simple ways. The first is security in the pipeline. That's about understanding your workloads going to the cloud and they're not uh, containing vulnerabilities that can uh, put your organization at risk. The other is security of the pipeline and that's securing the runtime in which these pipelines run and the access to those run and that runtime. So first, uh, talk about the security of the pipeline. So, Again, this is about access. Who has access to the pipelines? Uh, what can they do? And what are you logging and eventing on those actions? How well do you need to understand? And that these three points are going to vary massively from a startup to a highly regulated organization. But you do need to consider how do you understand what's going to production and who has the right to do that. Also, again, something to consider is securing the workload itself from the nodes of the server. So a lot of orchestrators today have, are multi-node or distributed, whatever, whether you're running Kubernetes or EC2 or whatever. You need to understand, can you secure the workload itself and access to those nodes? So again, depending on your risk profile, this could be something that you need to cover and make sure that you have coverage in. Security, ma security management uh, around uh, secrets. So again, when you think of your pipeline, how do you ensure that the secrets that it's using uh, aren't uh, available across your organization. You have tight controls in release those secrets, particularly if you've, you're going across multiple accounts and they're in multiple pipelines. What's your policy on that? How are you going to ensure that you have the right segregation from a pipeline perspective, from a team perspective, and even when you're working across a uh, multi-orchestrator, for example? Something key to understand because any, any violation within your secrets could expose your organization. And finally, one which I feel is definitely something of huge importance, but again, often the last thing people think about. Any orchestrator today can allow you to pull in code from GitHub, pull code from any open source repository, or pull in from Docker, et cetera, and other sources. But what happens if there's a vulnerability out in the cloud in one of those libraries, and ultimately you're going to pull that in in runtime and execute that within your organization? You could open up your organization to attack by having that type of exposure. So what can you do? One uh, strategy around this is to ultimately only allow containers that have been pre-scanned in your process uh, to be allowed to be executed in the code, in your pipeline code. The same with open source libraries if you're using any, any libraries. So essentially you've only validated those and that's going to again depend on how much you really care about or how much your risk is from an organization perspective. But definitely something to think about um, when you're building these types of strategies. So some of the challenges, again, going back to the three phases of team maturity, you're going to have to support traditional teams moving to DevOps, DevSecOps teams. You're going to have to support that transition. And therefore, um, the access models which they're going to need are going to be very different from someone who's beginning their journey to the end. You need to be able to support those. If you're in a multi-orchestrator, so maybe your organization has multi-orchestrators, you might have one for CI, uh, one for CD, or, or maybe your organization uh, gives a free hand. How is that going to be compatible with those type of access patterns? You do not want disparity between your tools when it comes to access. Again, that could open up uh, from a vulnerability perspective. Also around the responsibility model. Who's going to be responsible for setting these policies in your organization? Is it the team? Is it your business line or is it your wider organization? Who is going to mandate the type of access 
to your pipeline. Again, when you're doing this at scale and you take in that maturity curve, that can be uh, an interesting journey to take upon uh, because of the different points of view. So just shifting gears quickly. So that was security of the pipeline. Some of the things you need to think about when you're looking at your runtime. So moving to security in the pipeline. So again, this is about securing your workloads going to the cloud. And a cornerstone of this is around scanning technologies. It's one facet of this, but it's, it's definitely a key part. So what type of scanning should you be looking at? So on the screen, there's a couple of scanning. There is other types um, you can do, but these are kind of the main kind of themes. Uh, again, one of the most overlooked is around pre-commit. So pre-commit can be extremely useful to catch vulnerabilities before it hits your repository. So things like passwords in the clear, uh, passwords in your image files, for example, catching those before ultimately it hits the, the source code and ultimately can find itself either into your pipeline and possibly even out into the web. When you think of application code security, that's static analysis. So that's a non-runtime scan. So that's literally scanning your application code, but also your open source code. So there's lots of vendor tools that do either or, and some do both. But don't forget about the open source libraries which you're using. They could also contain vulnerabilities and very severe ones, for example. So you want to be able to, to at least scan the open source and your source code. On the other end of the spectrum, you're going to have dynamic scans. And that's focused on runtime scanning. So that's ex looking for vulnerabilities as your application runs. And again, lots of vendor tools and open source tools that can help you integrate them very easily into your pipeline. And finally, around infrastructure as code. You know, lots of conversations in this conference about infrastructure as code. So your YAML, your JSON files. So regardless whether you're in AWS for CloudFormation, Azure ARM templates, you know, your Kube uh, configuration files, your Helm charts, and so on, so on, so on, they can contain vulnerabilities and expose that infrastructure to vulnerabilities. Open up ports, for example, have non-encrypted data, et cetera. Again, it's imperative you think about what type of tools can you leverage, and again, there's good uh, open source tooling out there on the web and vendor tools that can help you cover these vulnerabilities. But like everything, there's lots of challenges. So a lot of these scans can be expensive from a time perspective. But even if you're doing delta scans, which a lot of the tools support, they can take a long time to scan. And when I say long time, it may not be maybe five or six minutes, but if you're sitting there waiting to push a deployment out there and you have four or five of these types of scans, your developer's going to get very frustrated and go off to coffee and probably never come back, right? So that's something that you need to consider when you're integrating these into your pipeline. Where are they going to go? In your pipeline, so is it going to be in your commit phase? Are you really focused on every commit is going to have to be scanned? Or are you going to push this into your acceptance phase and put these scans? But as I said around going local, definitely recommend, in my opinion, that you push this back into your local environment, enable this in your IDEs. Again, there's a rich set of tools and plugins, IntelliJ, Eclipse, or whatever IDE that you're using ultimately can enable this at the developer station. So they're not being told inside some acceptance phase or a commit phase that their code has vulnerabilities. So also an interesting one is around exceptions. So I'm not sure how much experience people have in relation to uh, this type of exposure, but exceptions can happen in relation to you allow a change going out into your production environment that only hasn't passed all your checks and balances. And this could be in a break glass situation or whatever. Now, if this process or your tooling doesn't support this, one, you may have to write this yourself, and that's a huge amount of engineering effort. Two, it could be manual, and again, going to slow down your process. And how is that going to look inside your pipeline? Or do you even understand how we're going to react to that if we're using all these uh, tools set together? What is your policy about it? What does it look like? Something to consider, particularly when uh, you're working in a large organization. Preemptive versus detective. So the tooling and the scans I mentioned before are preemptive. They're in your pipeline or gating as you go through. Detective is post-deployment. And depending on your organization, your ratio of one or the other is going to change. But you, you should consider both to enhance both security and speed considerations. And finally, um, around I mentioned earlier around workload support when we were talking about the strategy of writing out those gates. Um, a lot of the tooling um, lags behind the progress of the cloud, the cloud providers. There, every week there's something new being released, and therefore there's new packaging requirements, new technologies being enabled out in the cloud. What happens if your tooling doesn't support those types of workload? 
particularly if you're risk adverse, what are you going to do? Are you going to block those technologies? Your developers mightn't be happy because it's going to slow them down from innovation, or are you going to allow those through and drive some uh, shared responsibility model uh, in relation to that? So what are some co a couple of other considerations around integration? If you don't have a seamless end-to-end -end experience for your security tools and ensures that your developers and security engineers can work together and not having this lob over the fence mentality towards security, you're definitely going to uh, cause some friction between those types of groups and really not benefit from those integrations. Those integrations need to have actionable outputs. They need to have fast feedback to the engineers working with those pipelines to understand what the vulnerabilities were or what they need to change in their code. False positives will kill your DevOps initiative. So speed and accuracy are extremely important when you're considering these types of tools and integrations. And finally, when you think about the scanning, we mentioned uh, your compliance and uh, enforcement of your policies within your organization. How do you know that you've gone through all these gates? You've done all this wonderful stuff. You've put it all in your pipeline. It's working great. But ultimately, how do you know that those cloud workloads have gone through what you've asked them to go through? And that brings me on to my final piece before I hand it over to Juan, is around compliance and, and policy enforcement. Now, anyone who's worked in non-cloud, you know, it seems like eternity ago now, but when you think of non-cloud, a lot of these processes existed already. So you, you might have gone, particularly if you're working in a highly regulated environment, you would have gone through a manual process. There could have been 20 to 300 data points, depending on your organization. It was a painful experience. It was really slow feedback and ultimately became a bottleneck in your process and really stopped you actually uh, achieving any sort of continuous delivery or deployment. Now, you put that in the uh, frame of the cloud and your cloud adoption transformation of your organization. If you have this type of process, you're going to choke that uh, adoption right there and then. So what can you do? I think everyone will know the answer, and that's the automate, right? So it's pretty obvious, but there's a couple of key things you need to think about when you're looking at policy enforcement, particularly at this type of scale. You can't take a manual process and bring it straight to automation, particularly when a lot of those data points probably could never be automated in the first place. So you really have to work with your partners across your organization and your, the, your folks in risk or security, whoever is in charge of putting down these policies, what is important to you as an organization, and really drive what can you automate? What, how can you use that real-time data I spoke about in the opinionated pipeline, for example, to really gate on these types of uh, questions which, which your risk and compliance teams are going to be concerned about but really be only focused on what really matters from a cloud deployment rather than trying to automate those two to 300 data points. So hopefully that gives you an idea of some of the security challenges and things you need to think about. I'm going to hand it over to Juan. Juan's going to talk about implementing many of the components I talked about at scale and talk about the architecture and design considerations when you're looking at this. Thanks, Nick. I'm going to start off by sharing our mission uh, we want to accelerate our automation the same way we accelerate application development. With modern architectures and programming languages, plus frameworks, libraries, and a service for generic capabilities. But how do we know if our solution aligns with this mission? We do it by measuring the cycle time of any chain going through the delivery pipeline. We want to have robust and testable code. And we can accomplish this by using modern software architecture, such as event-driven or RESTful APIs, and modern programming languages, where we think that logic is best specified in code. There's no pictures no graphical user interfaces. And we need to find a common means to observe and troubleshoot what goes in the delivery pipeline and speed up the delivery through code reuse, having common function, functionality shared between your engineers, teams, and business units. As Nick mentioned before, we wanted to focus first on teams that were either 
starting the cloud journey or early on the path. So we decided to turn manual processes into scripts so we can expose them as pipeline capabilities. But why was scripting our first approach? For the teams developing pipeline capabilities, shell scripting was easy to learn and to use. They didn't need to have too much experience on the language. Therefore, writing shell scripts was quicker and easier to automate. Also, we, we wanted a quick buy-in from our partners. So scripting was the best tool to create proof of concepts and prototypes to show them progress. However, if we look into our indicators of success, we quickly realize that scripting is hard to test and debug. As they get bigger and bigger, they became hard to maintain, therefore they don't scale. Tools support for things like static code analysis or security code analysis was very poor. And if we look into the reuse indicator, code was extremely difficult to extract as common capabilities. This last indicator brings us nicely to our next approach. As our scripts were getting bigger and bigger, as I said before, we needed to find a way to create reusable and separated pipeline capabilities, such as auditing, security, artifact management, deployment, etc. These shared libraries could be defined in an external source repository and loaded into the pipelines at runtime. Modern programming languages was one of our indicators. So we started writing these capabilities using modern languages su such as Groovy and Python. This quickly enabled better quality and security in our code. And these languages were fully supported by static code analysis and security code analysis tools. Test coverage throughout the testing pyramid was also increased. And we can easily package these libraries using Python repositories or Groovy libraries. Nonetheless, we were still dependent on the orchestrator, as each of them has its own architectural constraints. In terms of observability, we can measure adoption, but we were really struggling to measure performance. As the capabilities were growing in functionality and becoming hard to maintain, we start to deal with monolithic-like capabilities. As an example, we could have a deployment capability that will uh, provide features like deploying to three different cloud service providers with different strategies, such as kind of release red, black, or green standalone. So this brought up the discussion around having monorepos versus multi-repositories. Big repositories uh, were difficult to version. Documentation and communication of these new changes were becoming cumbersome. The rollout of new changes and patches were very complex, as any change of the capability could impact on thousands of pipelines being broken. Or even worse, engineers need to constantly be upgraded to the latest version as you roll out new changes. So part of improving our delivery, we moved to a multi-repositories or microservice-like approach. Now, small teams can create their own capabilities. They will have their own SDLC. An engineer will just use what they need. Hence, the lead time of delivery was reduced. We also introduced versioning enhancements, such as having the major and minor part of semantic version to make bug fixing releases 
and patches transparent for the end user. But we lack the end-to-end -end view, as there's a lot of small moving parts. With small teams starting to write their own capabilities, codifying and standards on documentation, versioning, and multi-orchestrator support was a daunting experience. So we talk a lot about being opinionated, and for teams that were cloud ready, they needed a way to extend these capabilities in their own processes. So we started to look to expose these capabilities as APIs. So engineers were free to customize these automations when their opinions differ. So being an orchestrator agnostic was a quick win. So the engineers will have to wrap the API probably in a CLI and put it in the pipeline. Our APIs are fully observable. Things like tracing, logging, and deriving metrics from activity across the entire delivery flow. It is also easy to scale, and because we have several APIs, we can leverage techniques such as consumer-driven contracts to improve testability. We can also auto-generate accurate documentation, leveraging techniques such as test-driven documentation. But we still have some things to figure out, especially around performance. As an example, unzipping large artifacts in memory when scanning for security vulnerabilities. The capabilities still need to be wrapped by a CLI, and they, their engineers need to put it in the pipeline. So how do we make sure they are actually put in the pipeline? Things like compliance, security, and development. And the operation side of the house, we're still improving our strategies, such as disaster recovery, chaos testing, and high availability APIs. So what's next? One of the things that we would like to explore and where we think that the industry is going is this concept of an event hub. In this approach, we don't have statically defined pipelines. The hub receives events from all the stages of the delivery process and create automated actions. So we can stop using YAML or external DSL. We take the view that the best way to express this approach is in code. Thank you all for listening, and we will hang around in case of any questions.